Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you, Father in heaven, for this morning. Beautiful it is, for sure. How we lift up the whole invisible church to you, Lord, all true believers and all who are yet to come to be a part of that. The peace of Jerusalem we lift up, Lord. We lift up little David, certainly. And we thank you what you've done so far. No matter how it came, you're in the middle of it. You already knew it. You're in control of it. And we thank you for it. Forgive us all our sins, Lord, and give us some more revelation knowledge out of this J.B. Phillips interpretation of the book of Acts, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> we covered chapters 1 and 2 last week, and we're going to go into 3, 4 in the beginning of 5 today just because the thought ends there, okay? I'm going to do this because... I need to have it closer to my face with these glasses. All right, so chapter 3. A public miracle is going to happen, and Peter is going to explain what it is. Are you with me? Acts chapter 3. One afternoon, Peter and John were on their way to the temple for the 3 o'clock hour of prayer. See, there is no such thing in the church, but they were doing what they were used to. Okay, in Judaism. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that we don't do it. We don't have a three o'clock hour prayer or whatever, or pray five times like Islam or any of that. We don't have any of that. Okay, but this, so this is explaining what, what they were doing, what they were used to. A man who had been lame from birth was being carried along in the crowd, for it was the daily practice to put him down at what was known as the beautiful gate of the temple, so that he could beg from the people as they went in. As this man saw Peter and John just about to enter, the, to enter he, uh, he asked them to give him something. J- uh, John just about to enter asked him to, or, I'm sorry, saw Peter and John just about to enter and to give them something. Peter looked intently at the man and so did John. Then Peter said, look straight at us. Well, this had a meaning, obviously. They wanted him to focus single-mindedly. Not be distracted, just look at me. It's like when we try to get something through to the children or somebody on some really important message. We can't have them lollygagging, rolling their eyes, and we got to say, hey, 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 now, pay attention. L- listen to me. This is how it has to be. So that's what they're doing to this guy. Okay? He's doing, he's talking to anybody who's coming in, hey, give me something. You know, I'm, I'm a beggar. Can't you see it? Okay? And we're going to look in a bunch of scriptures here in a little bit. But So the man looked at them expectantly, hoping that they would give him something. So we're going to look up some hope scriptures. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. We're going to start with Psalm 71. There are a bunch of them, of course. We're only going to cover, cover a few. And always when you read the word hope in the Bible, in the English translation hope, it's always an earnest, intense expectation. Because God's word is true, it cannot be anything but an expectation. It's not a wishful thinking, it's not a, you know, that kind of maybe, I maybe no, it's a definite expectation, okay? 71 verse 5, ooh, isn't that good? For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. That's all that needs to be said, really. You are my expectation, earnest, intense expectation, because you cannot lie. You said you'd save me. That's that's it. If I believe you said you'd save me, I believe, therefore I'm saved. Okay? Go to Jeremiah 14. A little bit to the right, a couple of books. Jeremiah chapter 14. And verse 8. Oh, the hope of Israel, his Savior, in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land? And like a traveler who turns also to tarry for a night. 
Who is Israel's hope? The Lord. Who is our hope? The Lord. Are we not grafted into a spiritual Israel? Yes. Hallelujah. Lamentations. Keep going to the right, the very next book. Lamentations. I bet not too many of you spend a lot of time there. 326. Lamentations 326. Are you there? Yes. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. That was for all you youths. That's the next verse. <laughs> okay. Romans 5. Just want to bring a few hope messages to you so that this meaning of this man that was expecting, hoping to get something from them has a little bit deeper meaning, okay? Romans 5.5. 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Woo! That's good stuff. Earnest, intense expectation does not disappoint. Why? Because it's real. <laughs> there is no emptiness at the end of that one. There is no no. There is no rejection. It is done. It's happening. It's here. Hallelujah. Okay, chapter 8, 24 of Romans. For we were saved in this hope. Wow. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? We don't have to expect once the thing is done. It's here. Once we're in heaven, I don't hope to still get there. <laughs> I'll be there. And I'm already there spiritually according to Ephesians 2. We're sitting in heavenly places already, all believers are. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Keep going to the right. Because then you can't go wrong. First Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. God is love. We are commanded to love even our enemies in an intelligent way, of course. But yes, that's the way of it. Ephesians 4.4, 4, just a few more. Ephesians 4.4. 4. Keep going to your right. I designed this list so that all we had to do was go to the right. <laughs> Ephesians 4.4. 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in how many hopes? One hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. It goes on, one God the Father. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.5. Philippians, Colossians. Because of the hope, the earnest expectation which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. This is a done deal in heaven. This takes me back to that which you bind must be what is already bound in heaven. That which you loose must be what is already loosed in heaven. It's in heaven where it all starts. It's in the mind of the Lord who is in heaven where everything starts. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1.
Thessalonians and Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Jesus is our hope. He's our expectation, is he not? We're waiting for him to come and get us, and then we're all going to come back. Mm. Hebrews 6.18. Keep going to the right. I did that on purpose. 6.18. That by two immutable things. I'm going to start with 17 because of the thought. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. In other words, it never changes. Confirmed this counsel, this never changing counsel, by an oath that by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope, the earnest, intense expectation set before us. And then 19, this hope we have as in what? Anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil Wow, let me go on with that thought. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Wow, there's so much right there. We have a hope set before us, and we need to lay a hold of it, because Christ is true. What he says is true. He is the truth. And this is an anchor. What does an anchor do to a ship? It keeps it in place. It can't float around. It digs into the bottom of the sea and holds on to something. And it can't be moved now. Woo! This hope is an anchor. This expectation. Do you expect to make it to heaven? Well, that's your anchor. That's your anchor. You expect that Jesus come and get us? That's your anchor. That's the blessed hope. Mm -hmm. Woo! I mean, all hope in God is blessed already, you see. 1 Peter. That's right before 2 Peter. <laughs> is it? After James. 1 <laughs> Peter 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know what a living hope is as opposed to a dead hope? A living hope keeps on hoping. <laughs> a living faith keeps on believing. Are you happy now? then keep on being happy. <laughs> keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on asking. Those are all living. The moment they stop, they're dead. This is why faith without works is dead. It's not living faith because it doesn't do anything. Your faith got to do something, and then it's living faith. When James was saying, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, he was saying, show me your faith that's dead, which you can't do it because faith without works is dead, and I'll show you my because it's alive. Those are all the same thoughts, you see, isn't that awesome stuff? All right, last one, Titus. Titus 1.3. After 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, June, oh, I'm sorry, after Timothy, rather. <laughs> what are you laughing at me? Did you, did, did you notice? Well, I did that at the end. To sort of a, I'm, I'm, I'm making the hook. This, the, 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 listen, this is why a fish gets caught, because it goes like this. <laughs> it goes back up at the end. <laughs> All right, Titus. Titus 2.13. It's a very short book. Good book. And here it is. Looking for the blessed hope. Uh, let me start in, in uh, 11. 
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Wow. Yeah. Paul said nobody has an excuse. The grace of God has appeared to all men. That would be 100% every single body. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. If you lived back then, that was the present age. If you lived back in Luther's day, that was the present age. And now we're in our present age, and we need to live in this manner. Looking, so live, uh, right to God in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the church, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to meet him in the air. In the episunagage, the meeting around in the air, in the clouds with Jesus. How awesome will that be? Mm -hmm. Woo! All right. So when this guy, when this... When this lame guy said, hey, give me something, they had to have his mind away from what was normal and somebody throwing something in his hat or however that went. We're going to give you something special. Now look at me. Don't be looking down to see. Don't be looking if I'm reaching in my pocket or whatever. Don't do any of that. Look at me. Pay attention to me. Be really expecting for something you've never been given before. Wow. So the man looked at, it's verse uh, five. five, thank you. So the man looked at them expectantly, hoping, earnestly and expecting that they would give him something. If you are expecting silver or gold, Peter said to him, I have neither. But what I have, I will certainly give you. Now, quick stop. Now, Peter and all the rest of them had to still go to the store and get stuff. He didn't have any silver and gold to give away. He might have had only copper or whatever the, the pence was, you know, the, the might, 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 and whatever the, the widow gave, this kind of thing. So it's not like he didn't have any money. None of those guys had any money. That's ridiculous. They lived the life. They went to the market. They fished, and they had to sell fish for money so they can get other stuff with that money. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, but we get to sometimes, oh, you know, they had nothing, you know. No, 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 no. It's not like that. But what he was going to give this man was a gazillion times better than mere money. And remember, gold and silver was actual money and still is today. And thank the Lord that many states have now made that clear in their own Legislation in the United States that gold and silver is money again. It's a tier one asset. Gold is. All right. If you are expecting silver or gold, Peter said, I have neither, but what I have I will certainly give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There's a command. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We just sang a song about loving the name. And then we sing another song we didn't do today, but oh, how I love the name of Jesus, right? It's awesome. We, we, it's not just some, ah, the name of the Lord, the name. Years ago, I preached, if you, God, don't have a name, you don't have one. You've got to have a name. What is your name, God? When you, when you, uh, when you give your, your promise, Walt Hartwich gives a promise, my name's involved. And if I don't keep that, then my name is being besmudged. I can't have that. It's my name that's important. It's someone, that's why we're named in the first place, to distinguish me from somebody else. It's about keeping your name right with the Lord first and foremost and keep his name above and beyond everybody and everything else. The name given above all names. That's why his name is holy. You and I are only holy because he's in us. Yeah. via the Holy Spirit, etc. If you're expecting gold and silver, blah, blah, blah. All right. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So he expected. He got more than he normally bargained for, didn't he? Quote, then he took him by the right hand and helped him up. 
At once his feet and ankle bones were strengthened, and he positively jumped to his feet, stood, and then walked. Then he went with them into the temple where he walked about, leaping and praising God. Everyone noticed him as he walked and praised God and recognized him as the same beggar who, had, who used to sit at the beautiful gate. And they were all overcome with wonder and sheer astonishment at what had happened to him. Well, yeah. Then, while the man himself still clung to Peter and John, all the people in their excitement ran together and crowded around them in Solomon's porch. Well, of course, can you imagine? Can you imagine witnessing this? <coughs> when Peter saw this, he spoke to the crowd. He said, hey, there's an opportunity here. Look at all these people gathering. I think it's time for me to speak. Of course, the Holy Spirit put that in him. And he says, men of Israel, why are you so surprised at this? And why are you staring at us as though we had made this man walk through some power or piety of our own? It is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers who had done this thing to honor his servant Jesus. The man whom you betrayed and denied in the presence of Pilate, even when he had decided to let him go. But you disown the holy and righteous one and beg to be granted instead a man who was a murderer. Wow, what a trade-off, huh? You killed the prince of life, but God raised him from the dead, a fact of which we are eyewitnesses. It is the name of the same Jesus. It is faith in that name which has cured this man whom you see and recognize. Yes, it was faith in Christ which gave this man perfect health and strength in full view of you all. Wow. How different that is from all the so-called health and wealth people and all, the so, all these fake, health, uh, you know, healers, supposedly, who let you believe that they have some kind of special power. They're more special than you. God used them more than he's using you. Bunch of nonsense. Yeah. Now, Peter explains, starting with 317, he starts to explain an ancient uh, prophecy. Now, he, he said who the name, he told them their, their sin in denying this, this man and murdering him. And now he says, now, of course, I know, my brothers, that you had no idea what you were doing any more than your leaders had. But God had foretold through all his prophets that his Christ must suffer and that this was how his words came true. He was saying this is a prophecy fulfilled. Right now, you're just, you did, right now, what you're seeing me speaking, the healing, all this is prophecy fulfilled. Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That time after time, your souls may know the refreshment that comes from the presence of God. It's important to understand this, that time after time, what's that mean? It means it goes on. What's it mean? It means it is alive. What's it mean? It means it's living faith. Are you hearing me? Living faith, not dead faith. Living faith does something that corresponds to the faith you say you have. Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. He tells them you did all this, you murdered the Savior, but we know that you were ignorant. But now you're no longer ignorant because I just told you. Now what do you got to do? You got to repent. Simple as I used to tell the guys in prison, after, this, after tonight you can no longer say you never heard it. I gave you what you need to do. 
You need to be saved by Jesus, confessing your sins and accepting him as Savior and Lord. Hallelujah. Anyone who denied that and ends up dying somehow can never say, well, I never, you never told me, God. You remember when you were in prison and Walt and Joe came there with, with a few others and they preached and so forth? You were told just like that. And I, let me read this last line again. I like it. Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That time after time your souls may know the refreshment that comes from the presence of God. How, how do you know that sometimes, you know, we talk about being in a dry place and in the desert and where's God, you know, blah, blah, blah. And God allows us to go through some of these places to, have, to, to learn some things, to toughen up a little bit. Paul says, I buffet my body. Well, that's how he buffeted it. You know, I don't punch the air like a guy shadow boxing. I'm actually fighting somebody or I'm beating the bag. I'm doing something that's real with my faith. And that's how we, you and I have to be. And this is how we do it. Peter said, yeah, time, time, you know, as time goes on, this thing has to be a living thing. 4-1. Then he will send, or I'm sorry, I'm still, I mean, the last part of three. Then he will send you Jesus your long-heralded Christ. I mean, he's putting it to him. Although for the time, he must remain in heaven because he's already risen at this time. Until that universal restoration of which God spoke in ancient times through all his prophets. For Moses said, a prophet shall the Lord raise up for you un or unto you from among your brethren, like unto me. A guy similar to me. I'm in, in fact, he's the real thing, and I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a type of him. I'm a type of Christ, as was Joseph, as was David, as was all these guys. So Moses says he's going to raise up somebody. Like unto me, to him shall ye hearken in all things whatsoever he shall speak to you. And it shall be that every soul which shall not hearken to that prophet, to Jesus, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Those are the prophet's words. People don't want to hear that, those kind of words today. They didn't want to hear them then. Who wants to hear that they're going to be destroyed if they don't follow this certain path? Yet they destroy themselves willingly even and follow a bunch of nonsense, a bunch of liars, false teachers, false prophets, false whatever, and that's okay with them. Mankind is messed up in the head. The thoughts are messed up. Therefore, their decisions are messed up. And the only way to get them right is to be with Christ. Hallelujah. Indeed, he says, all the prophets from Samuel onwards who have spoken that all have foretold these days. So it's all over the Old Testament from one end to the next. You are the sons of the prophets and heirs of the agreement which God made with our fathers when he said to Abraham, through your children shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And then we find out who a children of Abraham is or who a child of Abraham is in Galatians 3, 7, namely the ones who have his faith. They don't have the faith of Abraham. I don't care what DNA you have. You're not Abraham's child. That's God speaking. So through your children shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It was to you first that God sent his servant after he had raised him up to bring you the great blessing by turning every one of you away from his evil ways. And that servant, of course, is Jesus. All right, 4-1. This is the first clash with the Jewish authorities. After Christ is ridden, everybody's happy and they, you know, they're doing their thing. They went to the temple. This, this guy was healed by Peter and John, uh, or you know, by Jesus, <coughs> through Peter. And so now the people are, everybody's hush, hush I mean, uh, you know, the, the scuttlebutt's out there, and the, the leaders find out. While they were still talking to the people. See, somebody ran real quick. Hey, priest, hey, hey, this guy's talking this, this guy's 
already some rabbis yappened. So while he was still talking to the priest, to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees moved toward them, thoroughly incensed that they should be teaching the people and should assure them that the resurrection of the dead had been proved through the rising of Jesus. Well, how else were they going to raise? Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in any of this anyway. Sadducees were, were, were different from the Pharisees and they didn't believe the word, the written word. They believed in tradition. And every time the word tradition is used in the Bible, it's a negative content or negative context. And it's used about a dozen times. And it's the word paradosis and it's always that and it comes out to 666. Go figure. <laughs> So every one of you turn from your evil ways. This is why Jesus came, to make that way possible. So they didn't want to, they didn't like the name of Jesus. So what do they do? They, so they arrested them, and since it was now evening, kept them in custody until the next day. Nevertheless, many of those who had heard what they said believed. And the number of men alone, not counting the women and the, and the teenagers and upwards, uh, the number of men alone rose to about 5,000. Wow. What a great harvest on that, on that one time. 4, verse 5 and following. Peter's pretty bold at this one, but only because the Holy Spirit's with him, because we know what he did otherwise, you know. He denied Christ already. All this stuff happened. But he got bolder and bolder as the Holy Spirit was with him and Christ went to heaven, or after Christ went to heaven. So next day, the leading members of the council, the elders and scribes, met in Jerusalem. Whenever you see scribes, it's like a lawyer, somebody who knew the law, especially the law of Moses. This is the Jews getting together. They met in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the whole of the high priest's family. They had the apostles brought in to stand before them, and they asked them formally. This is now an official deal. By what power and in whose name have you done this thing? It's not just by what power. By whose name have you done this thing? And this Peter, at this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to them. Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being called in question today over the matter of a kindness done to a helpless man and as to how he was healed, it is high time that all of you and the whole people of Israel knew that it was done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm going to go, ow! It's awesome. He is the one whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, and it is by his power that this man at our side stands in your presence perfectly well. He, Christ, is the stone <coughs> which you builders rejected, which has now become the head of the corner. In no one else can salvation be found, for in all the world no other name has been given to men but this and it is by this name that we must be saved. Could it be any clearer? I don't think so. Now they're all embarrassed, all the Sadducees, because they were sad, you see. So now they're embarrassed. When they saw the complete assurance... Remember Hebrews 11.1 1 said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If your Bible says substance, scratch it out literally and put assurance there because that's the correct translation. Assurance, not substance, assurance. Now substance will work when you understand assurance. Okay? 
When you understand that the faith is the assurance, you, because why? God can't lie. We spoke about it a little bit earlier. It's immut- his immutability is, is, is absolute. So when they saw the complete assurance of Peter and John, who were obviously uneducated and untrained men, they were staggered. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says what? Knowledge puffs up. These guys who thought themselves as being trained, these scribes, these lawyers, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, they thought of themselves as somebody who was above these fishermen. Huh? Are you seeing it? Mm-hmm. But only in Gnosis, only in knowledge. And they thought that knowledge builds up, but Paul says knowledge puffs up. Their heads were so big, I'm surprised they made it to the marketplace. (laughs) They should have just been floating like a balloon. They thought they knew something, which is still today. I have a PhD, I have a doctorate, I have a this, I have a that. I don't care. It's a bunch of nonsense, man-made nonsense. To lift yourselves up. And yet Peter, who knew nothing in their eyes, had full assurance. (laughs) They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Yet since they could see the man who had been cured standing beside them, they could find no effective reply. All they could do was to order them out of the Sanhedrin and hold a conference among themselves. See, this is what Antichrist do today. We're going to have a committee meeting. We're going to have the G7, the G20, the WEF, you know, all that. We're We're going to have meetings. Oh, Congress has to have a meeting so that we don't have to shut down the government. We're going to have a meeting. Oh, we worked so hard. We worked all night. We didn't get home till 3 a.m., I'm a poor congressman and senator. Duh, I'm going to cry for you. It's crazy. Get a job. Do your job. All they could do was meet for themselves and discuss it. Antichrist they are. Political Zionism, Talmudic trash, and all the rest. Republican, Democrat, right, left, all nonsense. What are we going to do with these men, they said to each other. It is evident to everyone living in Jerusalem that an extraordinary miracle has taken place through them. And that is something we cannot deny. See, they knew the truth. They knew that somebody healed this man and it wasn't them. He said it was done through them. They knew this. Talk about guilty. Nevertheless, to prevent such a thing spreading further among the people, yeah, let's prevent somebody getting well. Let's prevent that one. Let us warn them that if they say anything more to anyone in his name, it will be at their peril. See, if you take it to Jesus' name, then you're out of it. Your leadership's out of it. You can't say, I'm oh, look at me, I'm so great, I did it, because Jesus did it. <laughs> and if I didn't do it, it's like the Simon the Sorcerer. He was making a lot of money. And he wanted to make more. And the woman, the little girl that prophesied behind Paul, ah, these are men, they come of God. And Paul turned around and shut her up because there was a devil in her. And her owner, she was a slave. Her owners ceased making money, so they had Paul arrested. That's how today's world is, folks. It's about money. It's about money. It's about money. And then you have all these definitions of what money is. And today's money isn't even money. It's just a lie. It's debt. It's about who owns debt. If I own debt, then the one indebted is owned by me. He becomes a slave. She becomes a slave. They become slaves to me if they're indebted to me. And they don't even have to be indebted to me personally. They can just have to be indebted to the office which I hold or participate in. And that's why politicians want to be politicians. They're evil. 
demonically evil, bought and paid for by the crooks of this world. More evil, more demonic people. That's the way of it. Like it or lump it, that's the way of it. What are we going to do? Obviously, they did a miracle. Well, through them was done a miracle. We can't have God doing a miracle through anybody. Because then, you know, we're nobody. So they called them in and ordered them bluntly not to speak or teach a single further word about the name of Jesus. But Peter and John gave them this reply. Whether it is right in the eyes of God for us to listen to what you say rather than to what he says, you must decide. For we cannot help speaking about what we have actually seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not think of any way of punishing them because of the attitude of the people. Here's the thing, the thing where we see the masses having some power. They were afraid of the masses. Of course, Rome was in charge over all, but this was a local being, of, being afraid of the local masses. They might have picked up stones and started throwing it, and they didn't want that. They would have had to call in the Romans for help, and then Rome would have said, what, you can't control your own people? You guys are out of office. I'll put somebody else in, or I'll just take over and put my soldiers back in there. See, the Jews had a deal with the Romans. These fake Jews, these unbelieving Jews, these are the ones who crucified Christ, they had to deal with the Romans. You leave us alone. Let us, you know, govern our, ourselves around ourselves because, you know, we belong to Hashem. Rome said, okay, just give me so much of the taxes and you do that, don't cause any trouble. That's how the deal was. And as long as that nobody did anything stupid, it was a cushy little thing they made money of the Romans, they made money of their own people, and any and all strangers. That's, the, that's just the way it was, and still is today. So they're embarrassed. And Peter and Paul tell them the old thing, this is the way it is. <clears throat> Everybody was thanking God for what had happened, that this miracle of healing had taken place in a man who was more than 40 years old. Starting with 23 in chapter 4, after their release, the apostles went back to their friends and reported to them what the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices to God in united prayer and said, Almighty Lord, thou art the one who has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. See, this again, you find this all over the, the scriptures, all over the Old Testament, all over the Psalms, all over the Proverbs, all over everything, and also in the New Testament, even here. God is the creator. There is no evolution, Darwinian or any otherwise. It was thou who didst speak by the Holy Spirit through the lips of our forefather David, thy servant, in the words, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's Psalm 2, verse 1. Uh, go with me to Psalm 46, 6 real quick. I just want to... I made myself a note there. Psalm 46, 6. So we have it in Psalm 2, 1 and 46, 6. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Talking about the last days. 46, 6. Woo! It's amazing how Scripture squares with itself everywhere, isn't it? Old Testament, New Testament. Remember, the Old Testament is the new concealed, the new is the old revealed. That's how it is. Praise His name. Going on, 
For, in, for indeed in this city the rulers have gathered together. This is still their, their prayer. For indeed in this city the rulers have gathered together against the holy ser- thy holy servant Jesus, thine anointed. Yes, Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel have gathered together to carry out what thine hand and thine will had planned to happen. See, God already knew this would happen. And of course, the crucifixion was his whole deal. That's how Satan lost. He thought he won, but he really lost. God puts them in. God takes them out, according to the prophet Daniel, the leaders, that is. Every leader the world's ever had in every nation, God put them in there. And someone had said, and I believe they're correct, the people of a nation deserve who they get. Believe it or not, the United States of America deserved Joe Biden Mm -hmm. and Obama and all the rest. Because regardless, you've kicked the Lord to the curb. And you're woke with all the self-nonsense that that really is. Changing the uh, definitions of things to suit you. Liars don't make it to heaven. So when they had prayed, their meeting place was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God fearlessly. Wow. Verse 32 and following. Among the large number who had become believers, there was complete agreement of heart and soul. Not one of them claimed any of his possessions to his own, but everything was common property to all. The apostles continued to give their witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with great force, and a wonderful spirit of generosity pervaded the whole fellowship. Indeed, there was not a single person in need among them, for those who owned land or property would sell it and bring the proceeds of the sales and place it at the apostles' feet. They distributed to each one according to his need. It was at this time that Barnabas, the name meaning son of comfort, given by the apostles to Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, sold his farm and put the proceeds at the apostles' disposal. But there was a man named Ananias. See, here's the, uh, this is given a contrast on who was in the crowd. You had somebody who even sold stuff and was very generous and gave to help the, the church, those in need. And remember, those in need who were helped, were not made millionaires. They were just helped out of the need they had to no longer have that need. If they needed a a, 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 a clothing change or something, clothes were provided. If they needed food, food was provided. If they needed shelter, shelter was provided. Okay? And it wasn't the top of the line, and it certainly wasn't some low-line low life, low thing. It was a comfortable, this is what, it, what somebody deserves to live under. This is the food they deserve to eat. This kind of thing. You understand? It's a high side of the middle, I like to call it. Okay? So you don't get crazy over there, and you don't get crazy down here. And you don't, and you neither here nor there. You're at the high side of the middle. Everybody hear me? Yes. Does it make sense? Yes. There was a man named Ananias who, with his wife, Sapphira, had sold a piece of property, but with her full knowledge, reserved part of that price for himself. He brought the remainder to put at the apostles' disposal. See, he, oh, look what I'm doing. Look at, look at the sacrifice I'm giving, is what this is saying. But Peter said to him, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your mind? It's a little bit like Jesus turning around to Peter and saying, Satan, get behind me. Peter didn't know what he, what he was even doing and saying, and this guy, Ananias, didn't really know because he didn't, but he's still guilty. He knew he was lying. That made him guilty. His wife was complicit, we just read. She was lying, and she knew she was lying. That makes them guilty. So what's it say? But Peter said to him, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your mind that you could cheat the Holy Spirit? Wow. If God tells you to do something for the church, for a brother or sister in the Lord, 
and you don't do it, you're not cheating that brother or sister. Yeah, they'll go without, but you're cheating the Holy Spirit. That's what this is saying. It's also why people shouldn't run, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. No, no, no. Think about what you're going to do. <coughs> Contemplate, okay, do I, do I want to do this, or do I want to do less or more? But whatever I decide, I make that decision now before God and everybody, and then I'll do it, and then I'll be free. God don't care if it's this. God don't care if it's this. But it better be honest. Are you hearing me? Now, with that comes common knowledge to know that if we were all amongst other believers and we were pretty well off and the majority of whom we were amongst were really sad off, we know this doesn't cut it, right? Mm -hmm. You understand? It's that kind of an understanding of just the, the true situation plus what your heart tells you to do via the Holy Spirit. So Ananias, why is Satan so filled? Satan filled his mind. <laughs> And Ananias, listen to me. The devil filled your mind. Peter tells him. The devil got you thinking you could cheat the Holy Spirit. Eve, you can eat that fruit. See, before the land was sold, it was yours. And after the sale, the disposal of the price you received was entirely in your hands, wasn't it? You would have been better off saying, I don't want to give anything. That would have been much better and they wouldn't have kicked the bucket. It was entirely in your hands. Then whatever made you think of such a thing as this, you have not lied to men but to God. Wow. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he collapsed and died. Doesn't say he slept. Everyone, every true Christian in the New Testament that dies is, is, is said, said to be sleeping. I've heard people, the once always saved Calvinists, say, oh, these guys were taken to heaven. I don't buy that. I think he died and that was it. He lied to the Holy Spirit. And he had no chance to repent. That's just my personal thing. You may believe something else about it. That's totally up to you. I don't buy that, that they, they were somehow saved. It doesn't say that. It doesn't even hint at that. You only get that hint when you believe a doctrine that's not in the Bible, like once always. It's a living faith. How can it be once always? <laughs> once isn't life. Are you hearing me? So as soon as Ananias heard it, he collapsed and died. All who were within earshot were appalled at this incident. The young men got their feet, or the young men got to their feet, and after wrapping up his body, carried him out and buried him. I like the young men, so the old men didn't have to do it because they were too old to lift him. <laughs> no pun intended, but dead weight is heavy. Is. Yes. So the young men got to did this. You know, Enoch was taken to heaven, but he wasn't a liar. <laughs> These guys weren't taken to heaven early because they were liars. So they wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, it happened that his wife came in, not knowing what had taken place. Peter spoke directly to her. Tell me, did you sell your land for so much? Yes, she replied, that was it. Then Peter said to her, how could you two have agreed to put the Spirit of the Lord to such a test? Listen, you can hear the footsteps of the men who have just buried your husband coming back through the door, and they will carry you out as well. Immediately she collapsed at Peter's feet and died. When the young men came into the room, they found her a dead woman. That doesn't tell me they went to heaven early. And why would that be anyway? Then everybody, let's all sin so we can go to heaven early because I'd rather be there. You see, it's stupid. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. 
At this happening, a deep sense of awe swept over the whole church and indeed over all those who heard about it. Now, were they, let me ask you something, we'll close that today, but do you really believe that this is saying they were in awe because something wonderful happened to them? Did everybody think that, oh, wow, look what God did with them? People are teaching it. The Calvinist camp teaches this nonsense. Because they were once in. You see, they were part of the church. So once always. No! They forfeited it. They lied to God. Read the Bible. We'll start with 512 next time. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the truth in no uncertain terms. You wrote it down. You, the Holy Spirit, being the dictator here, you said exactly what was to be written. You knew the, the character of each man who wrote every part of the Bible and how they needed to be used by you to express what you wanted expressed. And we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to understand it all better. Help us to never be Ananias or Sapphira. You hate lying. It's one of the seven things you hate. Liars don't make it to heaven. It's clear. And when we lie, we don't lie to, to somebody. Yeah, of course we do in that sense, but we lie to you. That's why... David was able to say, against you only have I sinned. Oh, Father in heaven. Forgive us our sins. Continue our faith being strong. Make it a living faith, more alive every single moment of every single day. And forgive us again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.